Hello, everyone. Is this on? No. Hi, everyone. Amazing. Great to see the church filled out really well. Um, as you were walking in, you hopefully should have gotten one of these little leaflets. If you haven't, James and Harry are at the doors and we'll give you them. It's for later on's um, talk. So welcome. Uh, great to see everyone who's here. Um, I can see quite a few red faces from the ones who are at the North Coast yesterday for the Youth Day Away. So great to see everyone back and safe. And if it's your first time at Crescent, want to make you especially welcome. It's great to have you here and I hope you get to talk to some of the members here and to find out a bit more about this church and what we do on a Sunday and also during the week. Um, the announcements were just um, on a slide and will be on after the service as well on a loop. So you, if you miss them, you can hang about afterwards and see what's happening during the week. Um, so first song that we're gonna sing um, is in the supplement, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, and we'll stand after the introduction. Thank you.
Amen. Um, just one bit of announcement that is for Thursday. Uh, please leave the minor car park empty as Peter and Carrie are getting married. So want to wish them all the best for their special day um, on Thursday on behalf of the church. So just now let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for this time that we can spend together as a church to worship the living God. And we are thankful that Jesus is alive, that he is not dead, that on the third day after he died for our sins, he rose again. And Father, we worship a living savior. And because of his death and his resurrection, we can um, experience life forever. Our lives are forever changed because of what Jesus did on the cross. And Father, we are thankful for all, everyone who is here from the youngest little baby all the way to the oldest person. And Father, we just pray that today our time together will be a time full of praise, full of worship, and full of learning, whether it's in CK, CK+, Plus, or in the study that Jim and Alex are going to carry out later on together. Father, we just pray that we will learn something new today, something that will help us in our daily walk on how to study the Bible, and that we will learn something new about you, something that will help us and shape our lives for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to pass it over now to Ian Sullivan, and he is going to do the kids' slots. Okay? Over to Ian. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good to see you. It is especially good to see the young people. And uh, I have a question for you straight away. Can you think back a couple of weeks, going to school, did anybody dress up for World Book Day? Yes, did, yes. So World Book Day is a day when we celebrate literacy and reading and books, and we encourage people to read. What, what did anybody dress up as? I dressed up as Harry Potter. Harry Potter with the glasses? And yes. I could imagine that. Excellent. And did you dress up? No. no. That's all right. Well, does anybody know this story? Oh, it has failed. Yes, what is it? Yeah, it's about the crayons. The day the crayons quit. I recommend that story because Red was overworked. And I'm not going to tell you the rest of it. It was really good. And um, recognize any of those stories? Where's Wally? He's there. He's always there. And there's lots of other. So books are important and reading is important and it's good to do. Does anybody have a book with them this morning? One. Well, that is fabulous. Anybody else have a book? If you have a book with you, uh, well done, Joseph. Hold it. Anybody who has a book with them this morning, hold it up. That's improving. Yeah, we're getting a bit of movement there. Excellent. Let me see. Have a look around at all these different books. Connor, yeah, well done, Connor. Thank you. Great. So put the Bibles. To, that's a hymn book. Yes, we're not, we're not going there. No, no, I'm not being sabotaged this morning. So books are important, and I knew there would be lots of books. There's some of the ones I thought would come across. A, ch a child's first Bible, and uh, the Jesus Storybook. Junior EBR used that a lot, and I quite like it too. And then I saw some people were being devious, and they held up their phones, because there are Bible apps and, and that sort of book as well. But as you can see, um, it's been translated into... 736 different languages. That's the Bible. It's, I didn't know there were 700, but there are. And the, an additional 1,658 languages for the New Testament. I brought my Bible as well, but I forgot it. <clears throat> and you can see why I forgot it. So I think I'm going to be a preacher someday. <laughs> this is my Bible. I tend not to bring it every Sunday. I'm sure you can't imagine why, but this is my Bible. Everyone said to bring a pen, but I brought a pen and a Bible. So this actually, this is the Sullivan Family Bible. And it was presented to Jack Sullivan in 1933, which is a wee while ago. And at the very front, there's a family record of, of the different people. So, so Michael Sullivan was born 1818, and he married Mary Ann in 1847. That was 177 years ago. I never met them. I don't know anything about them. 
So this is a very old Bible. You can see it's illustrated as well. But whatever Bible you have, it is special. Let me explain why. It took 40 writers to write the Bible. And there are over 3,000 characters in the Bible. We don't know all their names. Um, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the second third, third third. And the Bible's actually, well, if it has all these books in it, it's really a library containing lots and lots of books. And there are stories in Tide which, which sort of break down into these categories, biographies. There are stories about people's lives and historical stories and war stories and shipwrecks and love stories and mysteries, all sorts of different stories in the Bible. But the thing about the Bible is, it tells us about things that happened in the past, and you sort of expect that. It tells us as well about things that are happening right now in the present, which is pretty amazing. But it tells us about things that are going to happen in the future, which is very special. But the most special thing about the Bible is that all the stories are true. Everything in the Bible is completely true. There's nothing made up. So, the Bible is written over a period of about 1,500 years. That's a long time. And that means the first writer didn't meet the last writer. And yet all these stories are written about the same person. The central person in the Bible is the Lord Jesus. Question. How come all the writers were able to contribute to the same story? Need helpers? See volunteers already jumping up there. There's um, Andy Wilson. He looks like a guy who's sitting at the end of a row, which is a big mistake. Come on, Andy. That's great. Perfect. And uh, you stay there, Andy, and we'll go along this side. Hello, Jane. Hi. Hi. Would you like to help me? You'd be great. Perfect. You come up this end as well. That'd be fair. And we'll have some young, uh, younger people as well. <laughs> Slipsies. Slipsies. Um, just the front two rows now. Look. Would you two come and help me as well? Would you two come? Oh, you give up. Oh, dear. Oh, you can come. It'll be fine. We'll look after them. So come on into the middle wee bit. Great. Perfect. And we'll put the very young people in. The, you're coming to the center. Perfect. So, Andy, I am going to whisper something in your ear, all right? And I want you to pass this message along the row. So you whisper to the next person. And then Andy's going to whisper something to you. And can you whisper it to this person? And whatever the message is, can you whisper it to this person? Simple. Apart from the fact... I'm wearing a microphone, so you, you tend not to be able to, <laughs> tend, tend to have problems whispering. So, perf. He's wanted to do that for ages. <laughs> right, Andy, come here. You stand down now, stand up, because you're bigger than me. <laughs> right. We'll be having our dinner later on today, and then we need to hurry back to present to hear Gareth Lewis. <laughs> Perfect. You pass it along. I didn't say all that. <laughs> I'm counting on you, Jane. What did I say to Andy? Um, we are having our dinner. <laughs> right? Is, is that all you said now? Eh, not, not really. But what I actually said to Andy is, We'll be having our dinner, dinner later today, and then we need to hurry back to Crescent to hear Gareth Lewis. Oh, so, so my four very capable volunteers weren't able to pass on a simple message from one person to the next. So from that, folks, you can see it's very clear that the stories in the Bible aren't just composed by humans. They're not just passed along by people. That the stories in the Bible had to come from the one source directly to Jane all the way along. So individual spoke to each person. Thank you, my volunteers. (laughs) 
So God is the source of the message. It's not a human message. God is the source of the message. God, through the Holy Spirit, used human authors to write his word and to reveal the message to them. And much of the Bible tells us about the Lord Jesus long before he was born. So what makes the Bible so special is that all scripture, every word in the Bible, every story in the Bible, every passage in the Bible is inspired or breathed by God. And it's useful to us to teach, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. And it corrects us when we're wrong. And it teaches us what to do to be right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good word. So that comes from one of the letters. Paul wrote that letter to his friend Timothy in the Bible. Here's what I want you to remember. The Bible is completely true, every bit of it. It's God speaking to each one of us. And to get to know the main character, Jesus, we need to read the Bible and think about what God is saying to each one of us. Because God loved us so much that he gave his son to die for us. Thank you for listening so well. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, for the kid slot. It was great to hear some amazing facts about the Bible. And yes, let's not forget that God is the one who wrote the Bible and that the Bible is true. We're going to sing um, 116 from the hymn book, God of Grace. And during that song, if CK and CK Plus want to head to the back, or just CK, yes, thanks, Heather, uh, just CK, CK Plus are staying for um, what's to follow afterwards, which is that Jim Crooks and Alex Cullen are going to have a live Bible study here at the front. I don't think it's happened before at Crescent, so very exciting to see how it's going to work. And it's going to be from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7 and 8. So our series, as you can see, is how to study the Bible. If you missed last week when Jim spoke about how to study the Bible from an Old Testament narrative, that is available on Crescent's YouTube channel, which is um, available. And I would highly recommend for you to listen to it. And today is going to be from a gospel narrative. So over to the band. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining with us. Can I add to Rupin's welcome on behalf of myself and Jim? It's great to have you here for this slightly different Sunday morning. Jim, so as Rupin has alluded to, we're in our um, series on how to study the Bible. And last week, Jim took us through uh, how to study the Old Testament narrative and some techniques we can use for it. And then next week and the following week, we're going to be joined by Gilbert Lennox. And Gilbert will be taking us through how to study um, a New Testament epistle and also how to study Old Testament poetry. And that brings us to today and where we're looking at Old Test or New uh, Gospel narrative, I should say. And we're in Luke chapter 7 and 8 today. Luke chapter 7 and 8 form a literary block in part of Luke's Gospel. And if you see from your wee handout, inside we have three passages. The first two are the faith of the centurion and Jesus raises a widow's son. Those are from the start of Luke chapter seven. And then Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman, actually comes at the end of Luke chapter eight. We just couldn't make enough of a space to show that in in the booklet, but we've got two from the start of Luke chapter seven and then one from the end of Luke chapter eight. And this overall is one literary block in Luke's gospel. So Jim, before we dig into some of the ideas that we're going to cover today, what's really the aim and the purpose for this morning's service? Well, <clears throat> the first thing I have to say, Alex, this is a magnificent handout, um, beautifully formatted. Um, the, the purpose is, it is the first time I've ever um, been at the front of the church and not felt guilty for being unprepared, because... We're, going to, we're just going to sit down and have a study the way you might do in a Starbucks or at home, um, uh, in a home group, and uh, it's not going to, we're not going to have a polished, uh, here is the answer approach, right? We're going to dig into the text and try and work it out. So that, that, the purpose is um, to try and help all of us uh, learn some basic skills uh, when it comes to studying the Gospels. And one of the big problems with studying the Gospels is that it just seems like a random set of stories at first. And you're, you're, you read one story and then you read the next and it, you, you're trying to work out why does that follow that and so forth. So that's what we'll be doing. Perfect. Um, if you look at your handout, you're going to see that the four techniques that Jim looked at last week on Old Testament narrative are located here. And then underneath on the front, you'll see the three that we're going to study today. So what we're going to look at today across the three passages that we have are how to analyze the narrative how to link passages together, and then how to contrast passages at the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those, we're going to build upon each one as we go throughout this. So to begin, we're going to look at narrative analysis or how to analyze the narrative. And we're going to turn to Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10 for this. And what we're going to do is um, Jim's going to read the passage, and then we're going to start looking into it in more depth. As we go, um, I'll do some underlining on on screen, hopefully, if technology if technology holds up, but you'll have your handout. It'd be really great if you could follow along with us, and if you have a pen to underline some things, to really work through it yourselves, and if not, just follow along with the text yourself, and maybe you could do this yourself at home later on today. So Jim, would you mind reading just sure. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10? When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Thanks, Jim. So the first technique we're going to look at this morning is narrative analysis, or how to analyze the narrative. And really, that just means we're going to dig into the scene itself. Consider who's involved, what are they like, what's sort of the direction of travel, who's going where, and start to peel back some of the things that we can learn when we go through this. 
And one of the best ways that we can do that is to imagine the scene as a stage play. So we'll consider who's on the stage, the characters that are involved, and maybe give a quick overview of how the scene would play out. So in this example, we have Jesus and his disciples, and they can almost be imagined at the left of the stage here. And throughout we see basically not one, but two separate delegations come across from the right of the stage to meet him, to come and see, and have been sent from a centurion. Now this centurion and his servant, the man who is ill in this story, they're not on stage. We can almost imagine they're in a separate scene off to the side. Maybe the centurion is is pacing nervously as his servant lies um, really seriously ill. So now what we've looked through this, we want to start to dig into the text and really try to put some answers to questions that we can ask about the scene and about who's involved. Before we do this, I think it is important to note we don't want to add things into what the text says. We want to read and dig into the text itself and see what it tells us. An example you gave me, Jim, was it's not good to say that the centurion didn't want to go to meet Jesus because he was scared of crowds or anything like that. We only want to focus on what the text itself says. So as we come here, we see that there's this main character involved and it's a centurion who's off stage. So I guess the first question, Jim, we want to ask ourselves is, What is the centurion, or what was he like? What do we know about him? Okay, well, let's just move through the text and see what we can say. The first thing is he was a centurion. So he was a senior uh, Roman officer, uh, a man um, of great status. Okay. But we're told in verse 2, he valued his servant highly, so he wasn't completely ruthless. You know, he just regarded people as things to be used. Um, and then we are told that he sends elders of the Jews. Now, that is really unusual, isn't it? Because the Jews really detested the Romans, um, but he, he, he seems to have um, built a really good rapport with the people in the region for which he was responsible. So they said he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So he's smart and enlightened and, um, uh, you know, not... A, he doesn't just use raw power. Uh, and then the, on, the only other thing I noticed was, uh, if you go down to says a verse 8, I think, um, <clears throat> he's clearly quite hierarchical, right? He lives in a hierarchy, so he has a boss, and he has people under him. And he says, I myself am a man under authority, and, uh, uh, but soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes. So that says to me that he, he understood that the world worked by authority. So that, that's, what I, that's all I've got. Excellent. I'm sure you've got other things as well. But. <laughs> we then see that he does a couple of things um, to try and get his servant to be healed. And the first one is a delegation that we find in verses 3 to 5. So this part of this is our first delegation here. Yeah. What do we learn from this first delegation about his first strategy? What was his first strategy that he did? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just reading. Yeah. Um, uh, the first, the first delegation, they, they. I don't mean to say they big him up, but they, they, they give reasons why he, uh, he deserves to have this um, miracle performed. That that key phrase, this man deserves to have you do this. Now. The reason I'm going to jump ahead here, but the reason that you know that's important because if you look at the very next verse, when he sends the second delegation, he says, "For I do not deserve." Okay, so there's something interesting there. Right? Um, so this first delegation is um, proclaiming his merits, saying all the good things that he has done. Therefore, Jesus should do this for him. Okay. Yep. So we've got this. Yeah, this first delegation. It's all about merit. What he's done to deserve this. Then, as we move into sort of the second delegation underneath here, to the end, from verse 6 to the end of of the passage, we sort of get this strange part where, if you imagine on the stage, they probably haven't even made it all the way across to the other side of the stage when another delegation comes to him. So I guess we've got to ask ourselves these questions. Why did he send this one? What has changed? And we'll not answer these directly, but we'll answer them through this next question, okay? So considering those questions, why has he sent the next one and what's changed? 
we ask, how do we get answers from what the second delegation says? So what is about the second delegation and what they say that answers those questions? So in many ways, the secret to good narrative analysis is to ask the right question. Once you have found the right question, you, you've got a chance of unlocking the text. And the obvious question here is, what changed his mind? Why did he send a second delegation? What, what happened to him? Um, because the second delegation, he, he says, he, the message is, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word of my servant will be healed. And then he says, for I myself am a man under authority. So, I mean, it just seems a bit of a non sequitur. Um, what's all this stuff about, you know, I myself am a man under authority? Well, think about it this way. He, he has sent the first delegation, okay? And uh, they've given a big long list of all the good things that he's done. And he, he's, as you say, probably pacing up and down in, outside the, the sick man's room. And he's thinking to himself, no, I... How is Jesus going to do this? I mean, is it some sort of miracle work or some sort of magic? No, well, how, how, how does anybody get anything done? Well, uh, people do things if they have authority. I have authority. I tell this one to go and he goes. I tell this one to come and he comes. So the way Jesus must be able to do this is that he must have authority. And I sort of visualize him clapping his, head, his hand to his head and saying, I have just asked someone who has authority over sickness and death to come to my house. And I've told him all the good things I've done. And so I think at this point he is using his logic to work out who Jesus is. And he realizes that his initial strategy, which is to um, uh, proclaim all his own merits, is nonsense. He realizes Jesus has authority over life and death, and therefore all he can do is uh, ask for his mercy. And that's what he does. He says, I, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. As we mentioned earlier, Luke 7 and 8 form a literary block, so this idea of authority actually gets looked at in more detail throughout the passages here. We can even see, we'll see it throughout the passage we look at today, but also even as an aside in Luke 8, 22 to 25, we read the story of Jesus calming the storms. It's all about building on this idea of Jesus' authority. Um, so maybe that's something you want to look at um, later yourselves. With all this in mind, as we sort of come to the end of this section, we really want to ask ourselves two questions here, Jim, and this is a good um, mindset to have throughout all study of narrative analysis and throughout the, 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 the gospel narratives. And there to ask ourselves the questions from this, what do we learn about the gospel and what do we learn about Jesus? So what can we take from this okay. about what we learn about the gospel itself and Jesus Christ? Well, the first delegation represents how most people think salvation works, right? All, in fact, most religions of the world are like this first delegation. We think we work up enough merit and we try and make a case to God to do something for us or to save us in some way uh, because we deserve it, because we have done you know, uh, a certain amount of good and we haven't done very much wrong things. Um, uh, uh, but that is, is not the whole. The point here is that faith comes when you recognize who Jesus is. That is the key thing. Faith is recognizing who Jesus is, and in this case, that he had authority over life and death. And, and because you recognize who Jesus is, uh, then what you do is you, you, you don't try and portray your merit. You plead for mercy. Okay. So in many ways, this, you see this guy uh, working out who Jesus is, is, is one of the interesting things about this story. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. We're now going to move on to our second section, which is immediately afterwards um, in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. And in this passage, what we're going to consider is the technique of linking passages that are tied together. So before we read the passage, I just want to note, if you look at the start of verse 11, you see the phrase, soon afterward, okay? Soon afterward suggests that these two passages are tied together. They aren't just randomly put side by side in the text. So that gives us indication that there's got to be something that links these two together Correct. when we come to study it. So before we get into the, some of the techniques, would you mind just reading this passage for us, Jim? Sure. Let me just say, if you contrast verse 11, the soon after, with the, the very beginning of chapter 7, which is a clear literary break, when Jesus had finished saying all this, 
he entered Capernaum. So Luke is saying, right, we're on to a new, a new phase here, a new stage. But this next story is deliberately linked. Okay. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer. They were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Thank you, Jim. Before we start into the concept of Lincoln passage, I think it's probably good to build on what we've just looked at in okay. section one and do a little bit of narrative analysis on this passage as well. So again, we can imagine, if we imagine Jesus to the left of the stage with his disciples and he comes across a large crowd and a bit of a commotion over on the right-hand side as a woman is left um, mourning the death of her son, her only son, um, and basically that his body is being brought out um, on the street and there's a large crowd mourning with her. And the difference here we can see, Jim, just straight off the bat is in the first story, the delegations came across the stage to meet Jesus. But this time he very much moves from the left over to her on the right hand side. What we're gonna do is we're gonna explore why that difference is by asking some questions about the widow herself and the scene and what we see within it. So straight off the bat, Jim, what do we know about the widow, who's right. the, sort of the main character in this particular story? Yeah, so, you know, she doesn't speak. She's completely silent. Um, first of all, a woman, um, a widow, and um, now destitute because she has lost her only son. Now, in that culture, apart from the unspeakable sadness of losing a child, and there is, there is no sharper pain the human heart can experience, uh, that death meant that she was destitute. Remember, there was no welfare state, no support system. Um, so she was utterly helpless. I think that's the key thing. And, and I'm just going to leap ahead. There's such an obvious link if you put the centurion uh, to, uh, against this woman. One, a strong, commanding man, with high status in society, um, um, with an enormous amount of, of, of cultural and social power, uh, and means and resources. And then this woman uh, completely helpless. Yeah. Okay. The next step we're going to do is basically take these two stories and put them side by side. And what we want to see here is through both the similarities and the differences that we find, can we put together pieces to form a much bigger idea and a bigger picture? So you've already touched on a few there of how the difference between the centurion and uh -huh. his might and, and stature and this very um, lowly widow who had lost everything. Are there any other differences here or similarities, Jim, yeah. that we can initially just pull between the two passages? Well, in the first story, it's the centurion who takes the initiative. He sends these delegations to Jesus. But in the second story, it's Christ who takes the initiative. Um, isn't it? He, he, he just um, goes up and touches the buyer and uh, out of, because his heart went out to her, I love that phrase, um, he then rescues the woman by raising her son from the dead. So that's really important. I'm probably being unruly here, but if you just put those two ideas together, you see there's a danger if you just think of salvation in terms of the first story, which is almost like the human side of it, okay? In other words, you think that salvation is all just me working out who Jesus is and then going to him for help. That's true. But you, the other side of the coin is the divine side, which is, Salvation is a gift from God um, to the helpless. And so you need to put both those stories together and you see salvation. It is a gift to faith. Okay? Salvation is a gift, but like every gift, it has to be received. Otherwise, it would be imposed. So um, I think the whole point of Luke putting these two stories together is to show both sides of salvation, the human side, if you like, and the divine side. So yes, it is true that the centurion works out who Jesus is, and he uses his logic, 
He uses his experience, and that's all true. Um, but on the divine side, it is a gift to the helpless. So for us, with regards to the gospel, we know that it's not just either one of these sides. It's actually the combination of the two. It's not a halfway point. It's the two working together. Um, and that's what we can learn from Christ. And just before we go on to the third uh, story, you asked me earlier and I didn't answer it. What do we learn about Christ? Well, I, there are just two little phrases that have just uh, come out to me here. In the first story, verse 6, so Jesus went with them. That is astonishing, that, isn't it? Remember, the whole purpose of the story is that the centurion works out that the Lord has authority over life and death and sickness. Um, so it, the Lord doesn't stop and say, do you have any idea how important I am? Of course not. It just says, so Jesus went with him. That the, the Son of God has a servant heart. He just went with him. He was asked to do something and he did. That's an amazing attitude that we should have in the church. Uh, you know you are developing a servant nature when people treat you like a servant. And then in the second story, as I already mentioned, that beautiful phrase says, the Lord, his heart went out to her. And that is the... the uh, the essence of God's character, that big heartedness uh, and his compassion for us. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Perfect, thank you, Jim. That brings us to our final section where we're gonna build even further on what we've just looked at and consider the idea of contrasting passages. So the idea of contrasting passages is really taking two passages in Scripture that maybe have themes that we would think would be similar, but actually analyzing the differences between them and trying to understand why they exist, and also through the differences what we can learn about Christ. So this is now down to the last passage in, in the booklet, which is taken from Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through to the end of the chapter, verse 56, and I'll just read that now for us. So this is Luke chapter 8, um, reading from verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. So like we did in section two, we're going to build on what we've looked at so far. I think you'll see that these techniques are meant to be put together to build a bigger picture and to understand the text more clearly. So if we look at our narrative analysis again, we're gonna walk through the scene, okay? So imagine the main characters again. We have Jesus and his disciples at the left of the stage, and here he's met by Jairus, and then they begin to start walking to the right, where Jairus' sick daughter 
is. However, we have this sort of almost side plot that takes place bang in the middle of the stage um, and in the middle of this main story. And it's this woman who gets healed right in the middle of everything that's going on. And then after that has happened, we resume this main plot and move towards where Jairus' daughter is on the right-hand side of the stage. We're going to actually start in the middle here, Jim, and look at this embedded story, okay? And if you look at it, it's from around verses 43 down to verse 48, okay? So it's sort of stuck bang in the middle of this, okay? So we have this inner story. And what we want to ask ourselves, Jim, is we're going to start asking some questions about the characters involved here. We still have this, this ill woman, okay? Can you explain a little bit about what she might have been like and what her situation was? Sure. I mean, it is really curious, isn't it, that you have one story embedded inside another. Mm -hmm. I can't think of another time that happens in the Gospels, but they're clearly linked. <laughs> so um, I think the, the insight we get here is in verse 44. It says, she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Um, and um, in verse 47, we're told she came trembling. Whenever she's, as it were, outed, whenever she has to go public, she came trembling. Um, so I would say, and maybe many of the women in the audience can uh, empathize with this, I would say she was a, a woman who was easily embarrassed. Uh, and she had this socially embarrassing illness. It's a gynecological problem. And she spent her whole life trying to fix it and have it fixed because in that culture, uh, if it had become known, she would have um, been excluded from the community. So it's, it's almost she has this secret problem and it's highly embarrassing to her. And yet she projects a perfect life. And what she desperately wants is to be healed, but she doesn't want anybody to know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think she just touches the hem of the Lord's garment. Now, people would say that was superstitious. But very often, true faith can be mixed in with a bit mm -hmm. of superstition. You know, I mean, there are many folk um, from, say, other traditions who can be, on the surface, a little bit uh, superstitious, but there is genuine faith there, okay? So I would say she's very easily embarrassed. Um, so have I, have I, yeah. have I, Well, just to build on that, sometimes with these stories, we can almost just say that this is, you know, a story of great faith and, and how the Lord healed her because of her faith, which is true. But actually, we can dig a little bit deeper into the specifics of this. And one of the questions I think a lot of us would ask when we read this passage is, why did he force her to the front? Yes. Why did he not just let her sort of go off healed, you know, she, yeah. she believed? Why does he bring her out in front of everybody? What's the real purpose behind that? Well, I think there's two answers to that question. Um, the, but, but we have to recognize it does seem almost psychologically brutal, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, particularly with a woman who was so easily embarrassed. But the first answer I would suggest is um, that he, he was actually continuing her healing um, by, by changing the story of her life, as it were, by making her go public. Um, because what she really wanted to do was to say, oh, great, my, my mask of perfection is, is nobody will ever know that, that there was anything behind that. Uh, but he changes the story of her life so that she becomes and would always for then on been, be known as the, the woman that Jesus healed. And I, I think that speaks to an awful lot of us. We live in a society, and many of the young adults will, will empathize with this, which is perfectionist. And so many young adults uh, um, are driven by perfectionism and uh, putting on the perfect, uh, you know, the beautifully curated images on Instagram uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and maybe we have a guilty secret and we're terrified of anybody knowing. And part of salvation is breaking that particular idol and becoming the person that Jesus healed. So that's the first reason. Um, the second reason is actually now we have to think about why is this story embedded in the story of Jairus and his daughter? Because... Um, well, let's look at it this way. How do we think Jairus would have been feeling while this was going on? Not only had this woman stopped Jesus on his tracks, but he had then turned around and made her give her testimony. And he would have been in a, um, 
uh, almost paralyzed with fear. Because you get the sense, don't you, if you just think about Jared, the story of Jared, you get the sense that he had enough faith to believe that Jesus could heal his daughter, but not enough to believe that he could raise her from the dead. Because when, whenever they, um, verse 49, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. So, you know, in other words, it's, it's, it's we've got, she's dead, so there's nothing Jesus can do. So he must have been in a blind panic. No, I'm not going to make an offer. Anybody in CK Plus or, or any young adult, if you can find a link, a textual link between the two stories, I will give you 10 points. <laughs> I think this was a first. That might be a first as well, offering what, a tenor I, from the front. Have I ever given anybody any money? <laughs> um, from the front. <laughs> can anybody see a textual link? text in question on screen here. I think my money is secure. <laughs> Look at verse 42. What age was the little girl? 12 years old. How long had the woman been ill? 12 years. So Jairus has just heard this terrible news. His whole world has spun out of control. And those of you who are parents can just think, and he was thinking about the first time he held his little girl in his arms. And now she was dead, 12 years. And then he hears this testimony. This woman saying she had been ill for 12 years and Jesus had healed her. And on hearing this, Jesus turns, verse 40, 50. Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. So the other reason why Jesus makes this lady give her testimony is that he used her to hold up Jairus' faith. And I remember um, talking about this to the group of uh, student, students, I think they were. And there was a girl there who was uh, very embarrassed. They, they, they were going out to do uh, uh, street work and street evangelism. And she said, Jim, I, I am too embarrassed to do this. And we went through this story. And she, it gave her the courage to realize that Christ could use her testimony uh, in, the, in the salvation of someone else. So what we've seen now, Jim, from this passage is we've done a bit of analysis on who's involved. We've done a bit of linking passages together. We've taken these two si passages that are in the same block, side by side, connected, and have, and have seen sort of what we can learn through the differences and the contrast. And then just finally, we're going to take a little bit of time to consider the idea of contrasting passages, okay? So if we consider the story of the centurion at the start and the story of Jairus, okay, we see both scenarios where Jesus is met at a distance with a request to bring healing for someone who's dying, okay? So on the surface, we see these should be pretty much the same thing. They should be the exact same thing, and we should be able to follow the same pattern throughout. That's not the case, okay? So we've got to ask ourselves, why is there a difference, and what is the difference teaching us? Okay, so I guess the question is, what is the difference between the two? Why is that, and then why is that the case? Yeah, because it... it it seems unfair on Jairus, doesn't it? I mean, we've just learned from uh, at the start of this passage that Jesus can heal at a distance. He never sees the servant. He doesn't touch him. He doesn't do anything. It just says, um, uh, verse 10, then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So we've learned that Jesus can heal at a distance. So why didn't he heal Jairus' daughter at a distance? Well, Jesus is up in heaven. And... I'm very glad that he can heal at a distance. Um, when you pray for a loved one who is sick and they get better, we can rejoice that Jesus can heal at a distance. Uh, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes the loved one dies. We're never promised healing as a right, you see. But we are promised resurrection. And so when you put the first and the last story from this together, you get this balance that we can, uh, Jesus has the ability and the capacity uh, to, to, to heal. But if he does not, if he chooses not to in his wisdom, we are promised that one day he will come and will raise us up and raise up our loved ones. Uh, and I think that is the balance. Very often Christians go wrong if they think 
uh, healing is uh, a right. Uh, whenever my wife was dying, uh, and I got about 30 cards from people who told me if I had enough faith, Ruth would get well. Well, clearly I didn't, if you take that view of faith. But um, the truth is that God in his wisdom took my wife home. But one day he will raise her up. Okay? So that is the balance. We look to the Lord to heal, but we rest in the promise that if he chooses not to, even if he does not, then he, we know that he will one day raise us from the dead. Amen. That brings us to the end of our passages this morning. Um, we've seen these three techniques about studying and delving into the narrative and who's involved. We've seen the idea of how to link passages that are tied together, and then also how we can contrast passages that seem they should be similar, but what can we learn from the differences? I guess, Jim, just to finish off briefly, what can we learn sort of specifically from this text um, if, in summary, but also what is sort of the purpose and what are we trying to do whenever we um, study an, a gospel narrative so that whenever people go home today and maybe they pick up the gospel of Luke and continue, what are we really looking to do here as we, as we do these type of techniques for ourselves? I, I, think, I just think it's one of the uh, most natural and uh, easy ways to get into Scripture is to compare different characters. To, you know, compare the centurion with the widow of Nain. Or, um, you know, what, what, just another one. The, the, the lady who was so easily embarrassed, the Lord um, almost forces her to testify. But look at the care he goes to with Jairus' daughter in taking the opprobrium on himself. And, you know, he didn't stand up and say, I have raised this little girl from the dead, because if he had, she would have been a freak for the rest of her life. So he goes to enormous trouble to protect her. Um, and so it's just natural to, to um, compare characters, uh, because we like doing that. We, you know, that's why we like films and movies as well. Um, so that's the, the first thing. Um, but then to look for the rational um, arguments that, that the author is putting forward, and that's why he connects stories together. Um, and uh, so always ask yourself, if, if there is a little phrase like soon afterward or you know, two days afterward or something like that, whether it's clearly linked, why has he put this story after that story? Um, and uh, that is the secret in many ways to, to, to analyzing gospel narrative. Otherwise, it just becomes a random collection of, uh, of, of, of stories. If you ever hear a preacher saying, um, when, when they're given a passage and they say, we're going to you know, look at this like paintings on the wall of a museum, you know that he hasn't the faintest idea what the passage is about. Okay? He's just taking refuge in, in a metaphor. So always try and think through what is the logical thought flow across the stories. Perfect. Thank you all um, for partaking in this um, slightly different format. We hope it's been beneficial and helpful to you to see how to walk through uh, a, a gospel narrative passage. Um, we hope you'll be able to use it in line uh, with the Old Testament narrative techniques. And I think the key for this series is to show the differences that we want to take with each of these passages, how they need to be handled differently, and how we need to use different techniques. I don't think it's, it's wise to start mixing techniques across um, different, different literary styles. But I think, I hope that what we learned that last week and we looked at this week will be able to help um, whenever you come to study those different types of passages. And just to, to reiterate again, we've got Gilbert Lennox coming next week and the week after to continue and finish this series looking at um, a New Testament letter. An epistle. An epistle and, an epistle and a, a, a Old Testament poetry like a psalm. So it would be great if you could join us for those as we continue these ideas. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Rupin for a final hymn. <laughs>
the Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. We're going to stand to sing after the introduction. And after that, Jim's going to come and close in a word of prayer. And then there is tea and coffee in the cafe. Thank you very much.
Please be seated. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the beauty of your word, how carefully designed it is. We thank you for its architecture. Thank you that there is no um, detail that is too small to be unimportant. Thank you for its organic unity. And we thank you, Lord, that it reveals your very heart to us and your way of salvation. And so, as a group of your people, we say the Lord is our salvation. Like that widow of Nain, we were helpless and hopeless at the mercy of great powers who tower over us of sin and death. And yet our Lord Jesus has saved us from that. And so we can face the future with hope. So we thank you for what we have learned. We pray for everyone in the room uh, that you would help all of us, Lord, uh, to be able to feed from your word ourselves, not just on Sundays, but when we open the Bible in the privacy of our own homes, uh, that we would feed it from it, that you would speak to us through it. And we pray for any in the room, Father, who are not yet saved, who have not experienced the salvation of Christ, who have not yet um, come to that point where they understand who Jesus is. We pray that this day they would come to him not relying on their merit, but throwing themselves on your mercy and asking to save. So we commit ourselves to you now, asking that uh, we part with your blessing and in your fear. In Jesus' name, amen.